Thank you, Rashmi, um, for inviting me. Um, I think uh, uh, it's also uh, special, Ralph, that you've taken time out and responded to Rashmi's invitation at a time when I think there'd be an enormous flurry of activity and a cascade of commitments coming at you from all directions. I think it's we collectively appreciate uh, being in dialogue with you. Um, well, I'm especially glad to be talking to you as an artist curator about this subject we're going to talk about today. Thank you. I think the, um, the subject at hand really is the format of exhibitions that we call the biennial. And it's an interesting week that we speak about this because this is the week when the Kochi Biennale opens uh, the Serendipity Arts Festival, which is not really a biennial, but I think has some of those properties or ingredients that we sort of ascribe to this thing called the biennial. And in some ways, uh, this format of exhibition making has, as all of us would know, has proliferated uh, at a very brisk pace. And some estimates place the current number of biennials as being roughly 300 around the world. Which means that every 28 or 36 hours, somewhere on the planet, there's a biennial opening. And which is a kind of bewildering thought that, that this kind of an activity and convergence and this kind of an itinerary is itinerary is produced within the art world around the idea of the biennial. And you know, when we think of biennials at large, there are certain um, certain ingredients that that make a biennial. There is this idea of periodicity, a commitment to keep time and return. Uh, there's a sense of scale. Most of them tend to have a certain degree of scale. Uh, they tend to also have a sort of uh, a commitment to a place and and in some ways the place also absorbs through the course of the biennial impulses from regions far and wide so I think they always tend to have a regional or an international focus and I think this is broadly sketching out the kinds of biennials that happen of course there are various types of biennials and when we go more deep into the typology and taxonomy of biennials, we might think of, you know, who makes the biennial? Uh, how is it made? Where is it made? Or when is it made? And the when would not just be the date on which a biennial opens, but when the biennial was conceived. What was the inaugural impulse through which the biennial emerged? Um, and why did the biennial take place? So who initiates the biennial? And in some ways, uh, you know, all of these questions will of course come back when, and we would love to hear your views more elaborated, Ralph, as we go along. But to begin with, I thought it might be interesting for all of us to know a little bit about your journey towards art and the journey with art. Uh, initially as a writer, and then as a curator of several exhibitions, as a director of a museum or an institution, and then as a director of biennials. And I think each of these would have in, in a sense, a different kind of an optic, you know, when you think about art and when you sort of produce these situations. Mm. Well, I hope there's an underlying optic to all of it, which is really just, you know, I started as a writer and a critic in Los Angeles. And I mean, I'm really interested in art that has some kind of immediate impact on me, that visually stimulates me in some way, but also touches me in some way, so that I actually have a physical response to it. And I think, you know, emotions, the things we call emotions, are about physical activity in our bodies. And so that turns into an emotional reaction also. And then you have the motivation to try to do the intellectual work of understanding why you've just had that experience, how that experience is being framed in different contexts, whether it's a social context, a larger cultural context, or a context from art history. Um, but I, I, could, I was never very interested in work that was only cerebral, mm -hmm. or that was only visual. Um, and there was an Irish 
painter, he wasn't a very famous painter named Patrick Collins, but he had a very good statement, I thought, which was that art should go from your stomach to your heart to your head. And I think by the stomach, it's just that sense of your, your physical experience in front of something, um, which I think a lot of people forget about. But I think it's that base that means that everyone can access contemporary art. You don't have to be an expert if you can cover that ground level experience. And so as a writer, that was very important to me. And then I gave a lecture in an art college in Los Angeles. And there was an artist there, Mike Kelly, who heard about this lecture and was very interested in the subject. And it was on notions of patheticness, let's say. Um, so he invited me to curate a show on this at his commercial gallery in Los Angeles. And he said, they'll pay for everything, they do a catalog. And it was an amazing moment, because it was the end of the 80s, and commercial galleries for the first time, well, for the first time in a while, would bring in work that wasn't for sale. I mean, they brought in work from Europe, from New York, and paid for it to be part of an exhibition, even though they couldn't sell it, which was an unusual situation in those days, less so now. Um, and that exhibition was called Just Pathetic, and it was very much about, uh, it was work that was, for me, uh, work that could make you laugh and cry at the same time. And I was very interested in the way, you know, the classic slapstick comedy thing is somebody falls, they slip on a banana peel and fall down. And we laugh. Why is it funny to watch someone injuring themselves? <laughs> right? And it's, there are very complicated explanations as to why this is so. But I was interested in art that took this position instead of being a position of mastery or of being like a preacher and telling you this is bad, this is, you know, this culture is evil, you're a sucker if you are interested in it. Because um, to me in the US it seemed the artists occupied a rather pathetic position really, apart from having, being able to make a living if you were successful. American culture was about pop culture, it was about television and movies, pop music, and in Los Angeles, that was much more evident than it was if you were living in New York. If you were in New York and you were a famous artist, you could go to a restaurant and they might give you a good table. But in Los Angeles, nobody cared if you were an artist at that point. So this obsession with this idea of experience, I don't think it's really ever left me. Um, so that, no matter what I'm doing, that optic has remained the same. Yes. So in fact, while you were talking about uh, the gut response, um, there's absolutely clear studies these days that it's a gut microbiome that actually tells us how our brain's going to function. So I guess science is really telling us about the general saying that we had a gut feeling. It's actually the feeling generated by the gut in mm. a real sense, because it's obviously the signals traveling from uh, a bacterial world that is experienced as a brain phenomenon. So it's uh, uh, one of the thoughts, you know, in fact, uh, while you were speaking about this, the, the idea of the open experiment in a way, you know, to kind of, to test out something, you know, I think one of the thoughts that, that come to my mind about the biennial structure is in some ways the open-endedness, no? I think would, that might be a difference in terms of really uh, how you might think of, say for instance, your fantastic Gursky exhibition, which I absolutely loved at the Hayward, vis-a-vis -vis the kind of structure that you generate within a biennial into which other practitioners might come in. And would that be a, a shift in terms of a curatorial work? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, even though there are certain constants about Andreas Gursky's work, there's also a huge amount of difference in them. And he himself 
when it comes to installing exhibitions, is sort of an agent of chaos. He wants to disrupt any normal connections people would make, which was very different from my own approach in that case. But, yeah, I mean, obviously dealing with 80 or 100 artists in an exhibition is a very different proposition. And I think that's the most challenging thing to me about these biennales. Is, and I say that also as a visitor to biennales. It's very difficult to feel that an exhibition is still talking about that the conversation is going on between a hundred different people. And yeah, the conversation can shift and there can, but somehow you want to feel that those different moments are also connected. Because to me, the, the sign of a good exhibition is that the exhibition is more than the sum of its parts. So we all have this experience sometimes. If, if for me, I can go to an exhibition that's been brilliantly curated, and I get a real kick out of it. But I look back later, and I think, gee, actually, most of the art was just kind of pretty good. It wasn't great. But when you put it all together in an interesting way, that worked. So in a way, that's what you want from an exhibition. And when you have a 100 different you know, imagine cooking a recipe with 100 ingredients, right? You don't have a choice. You have to use 100 <laughs> ingredients. That's difficult to make them all blend together in a way that you actually want to eat it and digest it. <laughs> I think there's a lot of indigestion, biennale indigestion in the world. Yes. Yeah. And I think this consistent uh, pressure situation it creates on viewing as well as making, isn't it? I think yes. it's, uh, yeah. it's always time bound. So I think the temporal aspect of this commitment to return also is like a commitment to see. You know, you've got to see this material that's out there. And, it is. And it yeah. sort of sets up a situation where, you know. I think there's definitely a, a common error. That I think a lot of curators are thinking that a biennale should take two years to look at. But not only do they happen every two years, but there's so much work in it that you need two years to actually see it. Um, so it's, to me, that's the biggest problem with the analysis, is most of them are too ambitious. <laughs> that's right. Um, and the other thing that I think defines them all with, is that this imperative to be international, to be global. And I think part of this kind of viral multiplication of biennales around the world is about the desire for different cities. And almost all biennales are, take their name from a city. I think it's very much about an urban platform. Different cities wanting to claim that they are a global platform for culture uh, and that they're participating in this global discourse. Um, and then I think what gets forgotten is the actual people who go and see it, of course, tend to be local. I mean, even in Venice, which has got a big international profile, I think 80% of the audience is Italian. So I really do, I'm a very kind of practical person in some ways. And so I really think, you know, I'm making an Italian, an audience, a, a Biennale for Italians. They get very upset with me in the office in Venice when I say things like this, because they want to have this, everyone wants this international profile. But you have to think, who are the users? And of course, there are secondary tiers of users. If you just hear about an idea, you're a user of some yes. kind. Maybe you read a newspaper review of it, and some idea comes through. But. Um, Yeah, in some ways, I think, you know, I mean, I often think of biennials as this kind of lively moment mm. in the life of a city when somehow there's a dimension of liveliness that emerges in everyday life. And unlike <clears throat> large exhibitions, which might happen in a museum where you enter a gate and you enclose yourself within it, biennials also tend to have this element of a map carrying explorer, visitor who then rubs participates within this liveliness 
but also in a way connects to the city that's going on its task, on its own routine, its own journey towards its own livelihood seeking or whatever. And there's this march of the city and the biennial sort of emerges within it. And in some ways, I think there's this question really, I think when I was curating the Kochi Biennial, for instance, you know, always this sort of the weight of the civic dimension would, would appear to me that how would the questions and propositions and prompts or inquiries that are being, that are emerging through this process, how do they regulate or preferably upregulate the civic discourse? Mm. Uh, because, you know, the biennial then sets up certain key words that get talked about because artworks throw them up in the public domain. And for a participatory audience like the ones that we end up having in Kochi, this was really, the, the weight of that would keep me returning to the sort of drawing board saying, what is this going to speak to in terms of the city? Because the city is going to come in large numbers and how is it going to transform that narrative of that, of that town, at least for the duration when this is set up? I think that's a really interesting area to explore. And maybe my favorite Biennale of all, which is not a Biennale, it's very cleverly a I guess we would have to call it a decimale, mm -hmm. uh, which is the Munich sculpture. Munsters. Munster sculpture show, uh, which only happens once every 10 years. My ultimate dream is to curate an exhibition that only happens once every 100 years. <laughs> but um, once every 10 years seems like a really good thing. And, it, and the exhibition is all pretty much outdoor sculpture pieces throughout the city. Occasionally, there's an indoor piece. So the fabric of the city is part of the exhibition. Um, Venice is so overwhelmed with tourists anyway that it's, the Biennale is present but not over, you know, overly noticed. Um, but I do think that the labyrinth and nature of Venice, which is a city you cannot walk across without getting completely lost, um, it's definitely echoed by the character of the BNL somehow. That um, it's a labyrinth too, and it, the strange thing about Venice is it's. I think it's the only BNL that I know of um, that has national pavilions yeah. as a permanent part of it. So there's now 85 national pavilions with artists that are chosen by those countries have their own separate places to show. And then there's this international exhibition, which is kind of the utopian part of it. But I like the fact that in Venice there's this tension between nationalism, you know, countries wanting to show off and compete with each other, and this dream that we can all be together and live in a harmonious cultural exchange network. Because it's the only one, in a lot of places, the utopian idealism seems to dominate the discourse around the BNL. Um, and in Venice, I think there's, it's nice to have a ballot. <laughs> Fred, I was about to ask you this question, because you know, I recall some 10 or 12 years ago, maybe 15, you know, one would see several large exhibitions where I think it was probably this, this feeling that the nation space needs to be questioned. Yeah. And within exhibition making, there was this tendency for curators to say that I'm not going to identify the artist's nationality. Uh, you know, and there was this phase when that occurred quite a lot. And, and in some ways, I think perhaps that also parallels the rise of the internet and a certain sort of an imaginary sense that the world is sort of becoming more cohesive. I wonder where that impulse came from. The nation never really quite left the space of mm. the conversation. But I think in some ways, uh, the nation space and the nation state are both really now erupting as a really vital force. The boundaries of where nations end and another begins mm. uh, is really become a vital conversation, isn't it? And I think in some ways, um, I think the intensity of that moment, I think, you know, may makes Venice now interesting again, this, this question of, of the nation in some ways? Well, I certainly think it's probably not a coincidence that uh, someone, mainly me, from the UK 
was chosen. They've never chosen a UK-based curator before. And this is the year of Brexit, when in its own national identity crisis, voters in Great Britain decided to withdraw from the European Union. Um, so I think, yeah, there's definitely a sense that this is a conversation that somehow has to be addressed. Mm. I often think of this broad structure of the Venice pavilions of, you know, the nations that already had places within the biennial as having these beautiful structures within the Jardini, the gardens, and a certain emergent set of nations within the arsenal, the artillery site, as a kind of an, an infrastructural binary of some kind that is an interesting question, no? how these are located in some ways. And it's a totally bizarre logic, which I don't completely understand, because the first national pavilion built was the Belgian pavilion, which was something like 1910. Um, because you have the UK and Germany and France occupying the top of the hill. And OK, these were the European powers at that time. Um, but there are all kinds of weird countries that are in the kind of classy neighborhood of the Biennale. And you just don't know how they ended up there. Maybe they, you know, their aristocracy was related to the aristocracy in Italy or something. But it doesn't make any sense. Um, so yeah, it's interesting how these histories that can't actually be corrected in a way in this system. So that all these major countries, and it's great that India will have a pavilion, official pavilion for the first time this year. And then you are in it, yeah. Marina's in it. Um, but, you know, there you have India and China, um, one third of the world basically occupying two areas in the back of the arsenale. I mean, it's a very strange setup, which is why, in a way, I think we have to think of every Biennale really as a regional Biennale. And I did try to make a pitch to my bosses in Venice that this was basically a European Biennale. Um, and to me, the most interesting Biennales are regional. And I think it's a model that maybe the Havana Biennale pioneered in the 1980s, really said, we're going to be a, a southern Biennale. And we're really going to look, we're going to focus on the Caribbean and South tropics. America, the yeah. tropics. To me, you know, if I'm traveling, I don't really want to go to across the world and go see the Shanghai Biennale and see the same artists are there who were in the Berlin Biennale that I saw last year. And I think in terms of also finding a common cultural background that the works are engaging with, the regional model also can make more sense. Um, but, you know, it's sort of the strange status to be global, right? And to want to be the seat of a global cultural moment. You know, I think there's this feeling that if you have a Biennale, you're a, a temporary center of global culture. That's the pretense. Um, and it comes from these historical shows in the 19th century, the Great Exposition, yes. the Great Exhibition in London in 1851, and there were even earlier ones on the European continent, uh, which were trade and industry shows as well as art shows. Um, but they tried to, in a sense, sum up the, what, what could we call it, the, uh, the officially acknowledged world at that point in time. Yeah, I think there's lots of, you know, Biennales are like minefields of <laughs> just cultural dynamite. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in, in some ways, the, um, 
uh, I think in all of this, I think one sort of redeeming fact about Bioneers in some ways, at least to me as an artist, seems to be this possibility that you know one can almost treat the biennial as a kind of de-extinction project where endangered ideas in your own notebooks can somehow be retrieved because in some ways there's a informality that also a biennial ideally sets up you know and I think uh, in some ways I think as, as curators and artists in some ways as you're you know you open a notebook and there's something that's about to die, it might just have, you know, a real opportunity to sort of incubate itself in an environment where the assembly seems temporary anyways. It's, it's emergent, it disappears, and in some ways offering something. And I wonder if with the invitation to curate the Venice Biennial, were there certain elements in your notebook that began to sort of call out, you know, how was your earliest processes? Mm. Well, my first idea was to invite 80 artists to come and live in Venice for three months and make all their work on site. Um, and that turned out to be much more expensive an idea than actually shipping work. Because my thought was, gee, my biggest budget is for transportation. Um, and isn't it crazy? Who likes to give all this money to the shipping companies, right? I'd rather give it to artists. But then the cost of living in Venice, because it's such a tourist site, is so ridiculously high that doing this, plus most artists don't have three months to give you, or two months even. Um, but somehow, at some point, I think that's a good model for a, a Biennale. I was in the Dakar Biennale in Senegal. And it's in a building where there are no windows in parts of the building, and you have birds flying in and out of it. So there's, you know, climate control is not even on the table. Um, and it seemed like that would be the perfect place. And a lot of works also got lost coming through customs. So I thought the idea of a site-specific BNL where people just come, make work, at the end of the BNL it can be destroyed, there's no more transport, um, that that would be a good place to start <laughs> this experiment. Um, so it becomes like an extended workshop in a way, right? It's kind of... Well, yeah, or just a, a great ephemeral exhibition. Right. You know, One big uh, studio in a way. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, but the work in the studio would stop and you would then have an exhibition. But, right. um, yeah. I mean, I think something we were talking about before this conversation started was just the... You know, because you asked me um, if there were things in my notebook that, and there were things in my notebook, but I quickly threw them all out because I, I think I realized that actually uh, a theme was definitely the wrong way to go. And um, I came across a very nice quote from the American artist Robert Rauschenberg where someone had asked him, you know, how do you get ideas? And he said, I never work with ideas because they're much too limiting. Um, you know, curiosity is what drives my work. And I thought, really, that is what makes it interesting to curate one of these things, is you're really curious. And you get to go around the world, meet lots of artists you didn't know, discover all kinds of work you didn't know. And what makes that, what's your energy source for doing that? It's curiosity. Um, and so you want to create an exhibition that also is a curious, curiosity-provoking experience for people who come and see it. Um, and a theme is sort of like telling someone the punchline of a joke and then telling them the joke afterwards, right? And there's just too many curators, I think, who come up with this, ah, I've got this great theme. It's and so also profound. laugh on their behalf, I guess. Yes. <laughs> And that's why I think, and you said something wonderful about your approach to uh, Kochi. Yeah, you know, I think uh, we were just talking about, you know, how do you actually begin this process? And I recall distinctly feeling that, you know, I wanted that edition of the Biennial to actually produce themes 
rather than reproduce themes. So in a way, you know, to not necessarily think of the theme as some kind of a woodwork or carpentry that we bring to a set of nebulous ideas, but observe the set of nebulous ideas so you see a pattern. And it is, in a sense, an act of pattern recognition because then as you find these patterns, you realize that that's the infrastructure of themes and ideas that's coming to you rather than you setting out you know, with a bag full of themes trying to find ideas that match it. And I, in fact, felt that that's probably the only way to go given the dimension of a structure that is actually structured to detonate. The scale is just so large, uh, a bit like a really large star, it is a supernova in the making. It has to explode. So I think in the, in the structure, if it were to explode with some kind of synchrony, that's when a viewer of the biennial understands that there's an organic, self-organizing principle that actually generates this. So the only thing one would seek was to actually see if there's at all times some kind of an emergent pattern. And one would hope that the alignments and realignments one make is just taking you closer and closer to some of these, uh, these structures that a viewer might feel as an afterthought. Because it doesn't really happen within the experience, but while you view it, it's really the cohesive chorus, as, as Ralph was saying, that you recall that actually makes the exhibition. The exhibition's in the mind of the beholder and not on the site in a way, in a sense. Yeah, no, I thought that was really beautifully put. And um, I think you know, a, lot of people, a lot of people in the curating world try to think that they, they have a theory and an exhibition somehow is going to illustrate this theory. And then you have to theorize your exhibition. And yet, to me, the exhibition is the theory. Yeah. Yes. And that people have to be able to experience it and then read it in different ways. And then you hope that there's a nice variety of readings possible. Just like when you look at a work of art, hopefully it doesn't mean one thing. If it does, and you could write it down, you know it's not a good work of art. Um, and so this, to me, was the most important thing, was especially we live in an age right now where Twitter has become a platform for political discourse, right? Somehow 128 characters is supposed to be enough to convey thought. Um, and so the bandwidth of ideas is getting smaller and smaller. Um, our ability to really you know, it's like thumbs up or thumbs down, you know? Yes. Um, whereas the great thing about art, and I think it's, you know, there are other art forms that do this too besides visual art, but a lot of them are primarily commercial forms, so it doesn't happen so often. Um, and that art, visual art, I think, is an area where you get the most mixing of different ideas and different Visual artists steal from more different areas than anybody else, and you know, from philosophy to other art forms. And the great thing about art is that it holds, it asks us to hold different ideas in our head at the same time. It talks in contradictions that make you rethink, are these really contradictions, or are my categories telling me they're contradictions, and I have to rethink those categories. Um, and yeah, it's interesting to me. Neurologists actually say we can't hold two ideas or two images in our head at the same time. We can't. We can't. Yeah, that's right. And yet art always is asking us to do this. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, and I think we ourselves are completely contradictory creatures. You know, I mean, 90% of our behavior is unconscious. We don't even know why we're doing it. Um, and we're filled with ambivalence. We want things, we don't want those same things. We love things and we hate those things we love. I mean, we're, we're how can we possibly settle for something that wasn't equally complex? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah, and I think we actually live, I mean, so that's our inner world in some ways, no? where there's deep ambigu ambiguity, there's a nebulous world, and there's a nebulous response to the world. But somehow, I think when we function as sort of social primates that are active in the real world, we tend to seek crystalline uh, responses. And I think in some ways, uh, 
that becomes a contradiction and tension, I think, also for a biennial curator, because we were just speaking and we were just exchanging notes in terms of how the press might be the first line where you know everything needs to get clarified so quickly, whereas the ideas that are being explored mm. is in a space of nuance. And, and how do you sort of, you know, to, to cross that bridge where essentially you make uh, ambiguity and, um, and a spirit of inquiry the central focus? No, no, know? it's a very interesting question. I mean, you'll never see a newspaper headline that With says something mark. happened, but we're not really sure <laughs> what it was. <laughs> it was because it was so complex. Um, and yet what's interesting to me is, yes, as social creatures, to maintain cohesion as large groups of people. We have to have a, things that we agree to all uh, rules we have to follow. And yet, we're not, still not rational. I mean, the people who you, in the world who you think would be the most rational because their motivation is the clearest is the financial markets, right? They have one motivation, they want to make money. So th everything they do, all their behavior should be geared towards the most rational way to make money. And yet what behavioral economics has shown is that these people act completely irrationally all the time. And they're driven by two great kind of polar motivations of greed and fear. And because of those motivations, they make the wrong decision all the time. Um, so even the people who you think are so rational you're going to entrust your money to them, if you have any money to give them, uh, they're all acting completely <laughs> irrationally. Um, but I do think this thing about the press becomes a problem with BNLs because one thing, if you have an exhibition with 80 artists or 100 artists, uh, or, you know, one Biennale four years ago in Venice, there were 160 artists. That was sadistic um, for everyone. But then the press doesn't know how to deal with that, right? They can't write a review about 160 artists. So they pick out the curator as the person who's going to be the focus of their writing. And everything gets filtered through the curator. And then the curator becomes much too important. Mm -hmm. Because really, the curator shouldn't be that important. You know, you should, you're like a filtering mechanism. Uh, and it's useful to have a good filtering mechanism. But ultimately, what's important is the art and how the exhibition works. Um, but the media can't deal with that. And like you say, they also can't deal with complexity. They want to reduce things to simple messages so you can read it on your phone and feel you had a satisfying experience. And I think this orientation of the thumb that you just spoke about, whether it's up or down, is often such a quick response that, you know, I mean, I was reminded of certain Biennale symposiums that, you know, I happen to be speaking at and things like, especially in the, in the two years after that particular edition that I curated, where some of these session titles were actually phrased in a way, shall we Biennale? <laughs> Why do we still Biennale? And questions that actually borderline the word Biennale onto the idea of the verb rather than the idea of the noun. Yeah, and so is it a thing or a process? People love to do that. And in some ways, if we think of it as a verb, Maybe I think it it make it complicates the thumbs up and down because how do you, you know, how do you appraise an action? You can only sort of, you know, evaluate a thing. So I think the processual dimension of the Biennale I think escapes the speed reading of good, bad, was it great, was it not? And I think it's really about I think uh, the audience should probably understanding right that this is really a a process and in, and rather than an object, it's easier said than done, of course, but. <coughs> No, it's interesting. I mean, one of the things I think, you know, is human beings, we have the ability to do very complex kinds of thinking. But we also are designed to make shortcuts so that we don't have to go through the same process of thinking every time. 
Uh, it's a survival mechanism. And you know, we use it when we go to look at exhibitions. So you go and you run into your friend and you go, oh yeah, what did you like? Yeah. Oh yeah, I like this, this, and this. They tell you, oh yeah, I like this, this, and this. And you start to think, hmm, did we connect on anything? Mm -hmm. Or should we change the subject and talk about something yeah. else? <laughs> so there's a bonding mechanism that goes on also, I think, in this thumbs up, mm -hmm. thumbs down thing. Um, but I think there's a very strange moment in our culture now, thanks to the technology that informs our lives all the time, like our phone and, and social media, of needing this sense of continual feedback. You know, let's evaluate it. All right, we just evaluate it two minutes later. Let's evaluate it again. Um, and I, at the airport at Heathrow, they have this, when you go through the security thing, they have this big kind of thumbs up sign where you can press how good was your experience right. today, right? Yes. Um, and I kind of would like to put those throughout the BNL, just as you know, this terrible thing of like, can you reduce? <laughs> I remember my son, I think, went three times to that same thing, and he wanted to check if it actually counts each time he gives a remark. Or, yeah. Is there a way for him to quantify that he's been he's noted? He's balanced. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <That's right. laughs> In some ways, Ralph, I think it also brings me to, before we, I think, open it out to audiences, uh, I'm sure there are questions to you, uh, to return to the title. I won't even call it a theme. May we live in interesting times. And, um, and I think it opens out quite a panoramic set of responses. It actually makes you evaluate your times uh, by virtue of just reading it. But, and I know there's an anecdotal backdrop to how you came about it, but I think it's, it's best you say it. So I think everyone sort of, you know, it's probably an invitation too for people to kind of think about everything you've been thinking mm. about this process. Well, I'll confess that I'm sort of a pessimist <coughs> when it comes to global affairs. I mean, I read newspapers obsessively, and newspapers mainly report bad news. Uh, so they really do skew your perception of the world. So I'm trying to read less newspapers now. Um, so there was a, a Lyon Biennale recently that was called The Floating World, mm -hmm. which had a reference to Japanese culture. But Venice, because it's sinking, I thought maybe we should call it The Sinking World. <laughs> um, climate change, everything else going on. OK, that seemed just. You know, I didn't want to be the person who created the most depressing <laughs> BNL in the world. Um, so this funny saying that I'd known about since I was a kid, may you live in interesting times, which I'd always heard was uh, an ancient Chinese curse. And it's curious, because you think, why is, it, why is this a curse? I mean, I would think a curse is may you live in really boring times. Um, but of course, the idea was that, okay, ancient China, stability is valued above all else. And maybe this is true in contemporary China. <laughs> um, you don't want revolutions. You don't want wars. You don't want disasters. You want stability. So that the curse would be, may your children live in interesting times. You know, may they have the opposite of this experience. Um, but then it turned out on research that this was a made up artifact that probably nobody knows exactly who did it, but the first family of a prominent British political family that spanned two generations are the first people to use this phrase. The first one was an uncle, then his nephew, Austin Chamberlain, who was a member of parliament, used it. His brother was the prime minister of England up to World War II. Uh, and then people like Robert Kennedy, the American senator and uh, brother of John Kennedy, used it in speeches. So everybody treated this as a real thing. Uh, but because it was made up, I mean, no one in China, you know, this. right? Uh, and there's not even anything close to this. So it wasn't like it was a bad translation. Um, so that fascinated me, because we live in this moment where 
the proliferation of fake news on social media has also reignited a lot of discussions about, well, what is, can we say anything is actually objective or real news? And that uh, there was a lot of European theory in the 1980s that was all about deconstructing the official discourses of whatever area you could be in and really arguing that yeah, they, there's no objective standpoint. But now that when we're flooded with social media that's just trafficking in outright lies, it's like the nightmare of post-structuralism becoming a worldwide virus of some kind. So um, this idea interested me that this fake cultural artifact had entered history where it had become a real cultural ar artifact and it's in some important speeches and interestingly uh, several major science fiction writers including I think Arthur C. Clarke used it in books um, but for me it was sort of the idea that yes maybe um, there are so many potential ways things could go wrong in different parts of the world right now and we know for the whole planet, things are going in a very dangerous direction in terms of climate change. But rather than just say, you know, um, times, may, you know, times are awful, I thought this idea that these are interesting times, one, makes you think. Um, it doesn't create a judgment on it. And also, of course, there are opportunities. Nothing's fixed. Things, there are interesting ways we can go in response to what's happening. So say in Europe and in the United States, there's a, been a resurgent of right-wing populism. And everyone's horrified on the left about this. But that right-wing populism is responding to the fact that a large segment of those societies were ignored by an elite that was running things. And it, it won't just go away because you don't like it. But that creates an interesting opportunity to try to redress those relationships in society so that those kinds of gulfs don't exist, and then the demagogue leaders who prey on people who feel marginalized or alienated don't have the same constituency. So I do think living in interesting times, uh, yeah, I mean, I wake up and I want to read the newspaper, right? <laughs> it's, it's, and try to see between fact and fiction. Yes, and <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I think as, you know, in all our sort of you know, personal contemplative practices, whatever they might be, we always struggle between the fact and fundamental reality, right? But now we are actually having to deal with upfront fact and fiction, where really fact is on the borderline of being non-fact and appearing as fact. So I think it's really about going through what appears like fact and then trying to sort of seek out reality out of this graded, opacity that the sort of world of information seems to offer today in some ways. Well, and artists create alternative realities in one level. And so this terrible phrase, alternative facts, that Trump's flunky term as an excuse for the fact that he was always completely stating inaccurate facts. She said, well, they're alternative facts. Uh, right. Even the way Trump, in the face of his own intelligence services, saying, yes, we have definite information that Khashoggi, the prince, knew about this and ordered it, he can still just go, well, we'll never know. <laughs> right? That's right. Um, but I think there's a complete, I mean, there's no real comparison between the alternative that the artist's world is a parallel world, that it's in dialogue with the world we live in. And it makes sense 
without the, the dialogue is, is what links it. Whereas these kind of alternative factual worlds have no relationship to reality. Uh, and they're just bubbles. And you know, a lot of people are very concerned now because of social media news. You can filter exactly what comes down your information channel. So you can only f see the news that already confirms what you already know. And of course, we already do this as human beings. There's something called confirmation bias, where you filter out information and you only pay attention to the information that confirms your opinion. And there are amazing studies done about people who are confronted with how an opinion they hold is completely wrong factually, and they still don't change their minds. And interestingly, confirmation bias is now being manufactured by algorithms, no? because they already know <laughs> what you choose to confirm, and hence the information that's going to come to you is, is already fits pre in your pre view, fixed yeah. in your So, so that's an that extended neural network yeah. that we don't seem to even recognize that's chasing us and surrounding us in some ways altering us and hacking us, yeah. even as an individual in some ways. That's probably not a very <laughs> optimistic note, <laughs> but I think we can seek well, optimism from you know, your responses, I think, and you know, if there are any questions and any... <laughs> yes. Just pass around the microphone so that everyone can hear the question. That was, is this on? Oh, that was great, thank you. I'm wondering if you might talk about how you make curatorial choices when you have choices of what work to include and to be a knowledge. So do you go with what speaks to you personally? Do you look for what's, quote, representative of what you see out there? Do you look for uh, maybe underrepresented voices? Do you look for what you think should be more prominent? Do you look for younger voices? Do you look for what's gonna speak to the Venetians or the Italians, if it's in Venice, et cetera, or how are there conflicts, et cetera? Uh, actually, I could say yes to a lot of those questions. <laughs> um, except for the idea of trying to find someone who's representative, because how could you possibly judge that? Um, And uh, I, don't, I don't think, you know, there are no quotas for young artists versus old artists. I am trying to avoid dead artists, which has become very fashionable in yeah. Biennale's phrases emerged, emerging dead artists, people who were forgotten about and now are being recognized. And this has become a new kind of curatorial badge of honor. Like, I'm going to pull this person from oblivion and you know, give them the attention they deserve. And I think that's an important thing to do. But I do like the Biennale as a this two year time capsule. Um, so I probably will not have a dead artist, but it's still possible. Um, but a lot of it, of course, is personal. Um, at the same time, you surprise yourself and yeah, you, I mean, you know, did you have that experience where you th think, God, I'm really responding to some work I never thought I would like. <laughs> and uh, in this sense, situation, it seems to make sense. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in some ways that might be prompted by the work that you already think is in the exhibition. In fact, I think what's liking that work <laughs> is probably not you so much, but the work you've already chosen. I think I had that experience that's quite a lot. Absolutely, because that's you know really I interesting. initially also knew that one of the things that I, you know you could do as a, as a curator step taking a long pilgrimage in a short time. So my biennial was curated within eleven months, you know, and of its three and a half months, I had no assistant. So it was like a solitary journey in different parts of the world. But each time, you know, what you go back to is those inaugural prompts and ideas which became part of certain letters I wrote. So the letters changed quite a bit. So for instance, Manish Nai and Bijoy Jain, both here, artist friends I interacted with, may have received different letters of invitation, uh, but two prompts remain consistent. One had a idiosyncratic historical 
pointer to the age of discovery, the other from the age of discovery when a Kerala School of Astronomy and Mathematics was seeking ideas like infinity pointed to a cosmological turn. And it's a strange and idiosyncratic private passion, but you know, to kind of explore something like this and hoping that artists would become partners in this. So in fact, every time I knew there's a work that I've chosen and a small nucleus began to emerge, that began to call out for other work. So each time it's like as if a body of work was choosing other work, you know, in some ways. No, that's very interesting. I mean, I've actually literalized that process somewhat in that I've asked each artist who I invite, I also ask them who they would like to show next to. Mm. And I don't, I just say, you know, give me the names of several artists whose work you admire, and if you ended up next to the Biennale, you wouldn't be upset. So artists can get touchy about who they're next to. <laughs> and uh, so that's been very interesting. And in most cases, they mention people who I'm already thinking about. They also mention a lot of people I'm not thinking about, and sometimes I discover new people that way. And sometimes I just think, what were they thinking? Uh, I'm just kidding. But I mean, sometimes you just think, no, that's not where I want to go. Um, but I think you're right. It comes from this thing having its own identity yeah. and then making its own choices for its own logic, really. Its own uh, pattern of how things connect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Um, which if you'd started at, I mean, the, I think one of the problems that curators have is they're asked by the organizations who run these PNLs to have a press conference a year ahead of time and to have a title and a thesis. And, you know, what you were saying is, yeah, you, you do your research and you hope things emerge from that research. But if you have to start out that way, you, you don't have that. And you start looking for things, gee, does this fit my thesis? No, it's not any good. And so you may say no to some incredible works of art because they just don't fit your theme. So I wanted to avoid that dilemma so that really you pick things because you think they're really interesting. And they, for me, they have to function on multiple levels. And in a way, I've also tried to pick artists who do at least two different things that are completely different. Uh, so it may be a slightly schizophrenic view now. I just love that word. <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes me feel normal, you know. <laughs> yeah, so bipolar be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now. Hand at the box. Thank you. When you when you think of Venice, there's. Um, the Giardini space, and then there's the Arsenal. And my memory of the Arsenal is there's, there's always a sort of trajectory that, that is more comforting, whereas um, the Giardini can be schizophrenic. So are you thinking of the two spaces in, in, in quite different ways? Because I've always thought of them as almost two uh, curators quite often, you know, when, when, uh, when you see them. I agree completely. And I'll tell you here something I haven't told anybody, which is that actually they're going to be two separate exhibitions. I just think they always are, so we might as well just acknowledge it. So it really is a bipolar view. <laughs> Though I'm not sure if there's a manic and depressive side. <laughs> yes, because your friends can be very happy people too, right? Yeah, absolutely, so and functioning in the world. <laughs> One question at the back. Hi, Ralph. Am I audible? Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, we were reading your curatorial statement at the University of Oxford, and ten of us got into a really heated debate as to <coughs> how that plays out into our understanding of what we call contemporary art, because it's uh, an unregulated field in theory, because there is no one ism in which all the practices fit within. At the same time, it's quite regulated because there are exhibitions and there is this method of museology that would exhibit a certain kind of work. So as a curator, and not just for the Venice Biennale, how do you navigate and negotiate between knowing what works and not knowing what doesn't work and yet might fit into what you'd call the contemporary phase of art? Uh, 
I think so. Do you uh, want to respond I, I, to that one? You know, um, I mean, yeah, perhaps, in, you know. Uh, I mean, in some ways, I think that's a perennial aspect of our human existence, isn't it? We are always fighting the limits of our own cognition, right? I mean, in some ways, you know, you're just always at the limit of what you don't know. You know, I mean, in some ways, that's the, that's the zone we all function in most of the time, at least when we do interesting things, you know, I think. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I don't think curatorial work or artistic work or any kind of intellectual cerebral pursuit uh, would never ever have that binary between the known and the unknown. So at least from my end, I think that's uh, a very, it's not a comforting space, but that's the only valuable space in a way. You know, I mean, I think you feel like you're taking chances. You, there's some risk involved. You don't know if some ideas are going to work out. So there's not like you can, you know, follow a methodology and um, be assured in advance that it's going to work. But I think, you know, so I think every good biennale is going to have its moments probably of failure as well because you can't get it right every time. But hopefully you get it right in the most key moments, enough of them. Thanks. Can you hear me? Back. That was really thoughtful. Thank you so much. I have a question about uh, the Biennale as you know, this, this massive uh, exhibitionary form, as you, as you talked about, both of you talked about. Um, you know, I'm a political philosopher, so both you know, sort of uh, more on the continental side, which has become attractive, I think, to the art world quite a bit. So Biennales also invite um, a lot of reading and writing practices, and there's an interdisciplinarity to the to the to the form uh, or the forms that are happening in the biennial space, which I'm cautious about in this in this day and age of alternative facts and relativism um, and its attachment to alternative facts and of anything goes. So is there a way in which you guys could say, both of you, I guess, could say a bit more about um, strategies of discipline um, you know, in these times where multidisciplining seems to be the adequate response to uh, producing good art, good thought, um, uh, resistance, right? Um, it might be that this is a time for, for, for real discipline, right? Um, not, not a commitment to objectivity or to sort of um, uh, preaching truths, but to, to just think of, thinking about um, as inclusive um, or strategies that are as inclusive as as are possible that are that are not, nevertheless don't don't lack or sacrifice their their disciplining you know, sort of capacity. You mean like um, by discipline, like a medium or something? Sort of. I mean, not like so. I know that you know some. That there are reading groups that emerge. There are lots of publications that are attached to the, to the biennial, you know, through a variety of art journals online um, that cross disciplines: mm. philosophy, economy, history, um, art, art history. Um, and I just wonder if there's a way to organize that more tightly. I have to say that's, I mean, I'll confess that's a weak point for me, is that um, I really do f focus on the exhibition, and then I think people can generate from that exhibition, but I think probably, when was Catherine David's document? 1997. 97. I mean, she, in some ways, pioneered this idea of the big exhibition as the discursive a discourse generating platform and that she had like a hundred events that were part of this documenta. And it was really sort of the idea that the exhibition wasn't enough because it doesn't speak in a philosophical language. So we need to make sure that we have a scaffold around the exhibition that can articulate it in this other discourse. And as much as I respect Catherine David and, and you know, Oak, we followed it by having these platforms in different cities. 
But it all happened before the exhibition. So the exhibition isn't generating this discourse. It's like this discourse is somehow laying the groundwork, fencing out the territory that then the exhibition is supposed to occupy. But inevitably, for me, there was often a, a disconnect between the theoretical territory and the exhibition. Um, so there are artists, say, who I'm working with, who part of their work involves close collaborations with scientists or philosophers or economists. And so I'm interested in inviting those people to come because they're implicated by the art. But I don't want to set up the structure of, I'm going to also tell you how to read it in all these other disciplines. They can do that themselves, in a way, is my feeling. Yeah, and I, you know, sort of extending from what Ralph was saying, in some ways, I think it's also, um, am I, um, I think it's also really uh, how you kind of jaywalk into, in your own questions that you ask yourself, you jaywalk into territories without knowing that you've crossed a border in terms of your own explorations. And I think, you know, when you, and that happens pretty much in the studio, and I'm sure in, in the same way in a, in a curatorial setup, is that you're actually not looking at the discipline. The discipline is just a means to your understanding of the world in some ways. So, you know, so I think, I mean, if you look at physics, you know, what is physics? It's generated by, by a certain kind of chemistry, isn't it, that propels physics. And what is chemistry? And it's, it's within the body, so does that, is that separate from biology? And I think we can just move between even the way the, the fundamental realities of our world are structured uh, is really, you know, these are labels we've applied. But I think within our own creative pursuits, those disciplines actually don't exist. And I remember, like, when I was uh, with the Kochi Biennials, my edition called World Explorations, world, not the world, because we've been speaking about the way the world comes up so much in, in, in biennial titles. Uh, but I think uh, the idea of the wall, the spiral, um, I think one of the sort of points, uh, punctuating points, was really the voice of a YouTube blogger, uh, Michael Stevens, we saw, who so came up eight times, almost like punctuation marks, mm. each time pointing to questions that completely threw you off, you know, asking questions like, we all know the speed of light but what is the speed of dark? <laughs> and then flashes of flashlight, an imaginary thought experiment flashlight, that would cast a shadow of his finger on the moon. And thus, if he ran his finger within microseconds, it would journey kilometers on the moon, faster than the speed of light. But there is no shadow. And I think you know, these kind of questions may not come from, from within art itself but they could speak to the shadow play that Ryota Kuokoba did elsewhere. So I think you know, this kind of interdisciplinary journeys you make you know, get, gives you rewards in some ways to understand something you haven't thought about. <laughs> it's funny, this makes me think of, earlier you mentioned that biennales were great for those projects in your notebook that you hadn't, which I think is a really good <laughs> approach to take. And I think what happens on the curatorial side too much is that, and this answers your question a little bit, is that people look for what's an appropriate artwork for a global exhibition. I know something about borders. Let's choose the artwork, only choose the artworks these artists have made that are about borders um, or about national uh, identity clashes or about historical traumas. I mean, I, I, you, know, you can't have a documenta with at least two Nazi-related pieces, right? So there are all these cliches that affect, that limit the range of what people get to see in these biennales, which I think is, it's much better to go and ask an artist, what is in your notebook that you've never <laughs> thought you could make before? Uh, that's the special notebook BNL. We'll have to curate that one together. <laughs> <laughs> she has a question. It's, it's such a vast terrain. Hundred artists, the, the globe, where, and your own imagination, your own curiosity, which is your driver. When do you know? I'm going to start. 
I'm not going to look at any more work. This is what I'm going to deal with. And you start editing your curiosity. When, how does that happen? Because I can imagine the, I can imagine the need to keep exploring bold, ex, ex, you know, explorations. And your own curiosity, which is never ending. How, and if you don't give yourself limits of such themes, as you just mentioned, how do you stop? And you wait for patterns to emerge. The when do you wait till? Well, I think there's a pretty simple answer for that one. You wait until you get a phone call telling you you've missed your deadline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sooner or later, you, you know, you've got to hand over your list of artists. But you draw it out as long as you can. So you just carry on, and what do you do? So you give yourself a time frame, and you say, okay, so I need to write my catalog, so it'll take me six months, I'm going to stop six months before. What if the patterns aren't, aren't legible enough? Um, Not as cohesive as you want. What then you, you, you do everything you can to extend those deadlines. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, you don't go to sleep until you've worked out the patterns. <laughs>